Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Clark. Uh, good to see you all here tonight. Um, I am going to be giving this talk actually in about a week and a half uh, at Barcelona Ru uh, RubyConf. So I really appreciate you guys coming here to you know let me practice on you. If you have any feedback or ideas or cool things that you know about that seem like I should know about them, I'd love to hear about it. Um, I'll also be having uh, most of the stuff, the material will be online um, and actually at that address you can find links to all the stuff that I'm talking about while I'm going through and if you want to follow along with the slides that's more your bend, go for it. So anyways, the backdrop of this talk, so spelunking in Ruby. Now who here knows spelunking? Who knows what that is, right? Okay, that's, that's good. Some of the audiences I might be talking to may not know as well. It's, cave exploration, right? It's getting down under the ground. It's exploring the dark nooks and crannies of things. I feel like this is a really great metaphor for code. It's a really great metaphor sometimes for the code that gets dumped on you. It might be the code that you got from that guy who's not employed by the company anymore, sort of a legacy system that's hanging out there. Maybe it's some piece of open source software that you found that looks like it does the thing that you want it to do, except it doesn't quite, right? Sometimes it's necessary for us to kind of take the surface level of the code that we're working with and be able to peel that back, to be able to dig down deeper into what's going on and figure out what that code is doing. And that's what this talk is about. This is about giving you some tools that Ruby provides to be able to get in there. Now, I'll start off by saying one of the most important facets of being able to do this is the ability to actively read code. You know, to dig into somebody else's source code that you don't know, to navigate around and to find out what's going on and read to understand. There's a great presentation by Evan Phoenix that he gave at Scottish RubyConf that I highly recommend that's about this approach. Just about how do you crack open some code base that you've never seen before and try to read it to figure out what's going on. Those skills are integral to being able to do this sort of exploration. But where I'm going to head is I'm going to talk a little bit more about some uh, specific technical tools and tactics that you can use to go a step past that reading. When you need to interactively look more closely at what's going on in your, in your application or in this library that you're digging into. So, the broad categories of what we're going to look at, we're going to start off with things that just kind of come built into Ruby. A lot of these are going to be really basic and some of them you will probably be familiar with, but it's good to re uh, cover some of them. And there are little tricks that Ruby has built in that you might not know about. Next up, we'll take a look at gems. This is both gems that will help you in debugging and the ways that you can dig into the gems that are installed on your system because that's a critical part of being able to understand a Ruby application. You know, when you write a Rails app, you're writing a small amount of code on top of a large amount of library code. And while you don't always have to understand those things, it really helps if you have the tools to dig into them and do that. Lastly, we're going to talk about some other tools, things from alternate Rubies and the layers below Ruby in your computer and how you can use those to diagnose problems and understand your code. All right, so let's start out with the built-in stuff. Let's talk about some pretty simple things that Ruby provides us that we can use. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever written a line like this in some piece of unfamiliar code that you don't know just to try to figure out what's going on, right? Does this method even get called? Is this a path that gets hits frequently or never? Is this code unused or is it dead? The put statement, you know, there's, there's a term for this printf debugging that comes from C. And a lot of times it kind of gets maligned. People talk about this like it's a bad thing. You're a bad programmer if all you're doing is printf debugging, debugging just littering things all over the place. Pardon. Um, I, I'm not sure that I believe that that's true. And some of it, I think, comes from, you know, if you are in C or a compiled language, there's a long feedback cycle if you're going to do this. You put your statement in, and then you've got to recompile things. Ruby really makes that quick and easy. So don't be ashamed to put, put statements in to try to get your hands around what's going on. I will say, it might be a good idea to tag them with your initials. Because I don't know about you, but I've checked things in before where I missed that put statement that I left in there. And it's really hard for me to miss my own name when it's sitting there staring at me in the diff. So this will protect you a little bit if you're getting there. 
Another thing to consider is that sometimes you may not be able to easily just put out the thing that you want because it may get hit too often. If you're in a hot method, let's say this weird method in our system does some calculation that we don't quite understand. Maybe it's getting hit thousands or millions of times during uh, a second. That's going to make it kind of hard for you to be able to interpret that output that you're going to get. Well, one thing that you can do is slap a conditional on that. Now, personally, I like to use the BDUG uh, global variable to make sure that I'm not interacting with anybody else's variables or anything that's there. And I'll use that to gate off things that I only want to run at certain times. You can use this within a test in a fashion kind of like this. You would set that that global is true so that that's not going to happen. Run whatever test case that you want to see the diagnostics for. And then that ensure block makes certain that we turn that back off so we don't get all of the output as we continue going on. Really simple, really basic, just editing code sorts of techniques. But don't be embarrassed to try to use these things. This is often the first step to getting your hands around what a library is doing. Ruby also provides some pretty good introspection capabilities. So here we have a series of methods, Bork, Dork, and Mork. We call Bork at the bottom. And in Mork, we print out a method called caller. And the result of caller is just an array of strings that's the stack trace of how you got where you are. This can be really useful to be able to find the location of where something's getting called from. Just like sometimes it's hard to tell whether code is getting called, sometimes how you ended up somewhere can be a bit of a mystery in an unfamiliar code base. So caller is always there just waiting to tell you what you need to know about how you got where you are. Now, I personally like to put a little trick with this and join it with a uh, new line followed by a tab. And what this provides is a nice little stair step. The first line is not indented. The following lines are indented. And so if this method gets called multiple times, those will be visually distinct in the output. You'll be able to see where each of those stacks show up. Because a lot of times with this sorts of puts, debugging, you end up with a lot of output streaming on the screen. And anything you can do to make it so you can get your hands around it is a, a good idea. All right, so that's some really basic stuff about you know, outputting text from Ruby. But you know, that's not the only th sort of thing that happens. A lot of times, if we're digging into code that we don't know, it's because something's gone wrong. We've had an error. Let's imagine maybe we got handed this script that we're supposed to run. And when we run it, well, <laughs> this is what we get. It does nothing. There's no output. We kind of think that there probably ought to be something happening, but we're not sure. Well, you know, maybe the code looks something like this. Now, obviously, if it was this five lines, then I probably would have been able to just crack it open and look at it. But maybe this is buried, you know, nested 20 layers deep, and it's difficult to find where it's swallowing that error. Well, Ruby actually gives us something to deal with this situation, and that is the minus D flag. If you run Ruby with minus D, and run that same program, it will spit to the standard error any exception as it is raised. So even if the exceptions get swallowed or handled somewhere, they can't hide from you with this option turned on. You can find out what's happening, where it's failing, and then go locate the problem. There are some other things buried in Ruby around error handling as well. So let's imagine that we have this method. We increment a counter. We call this flaky method that fails sometimes. And then we've got some cleanup logic down in, in our ensure block that happens. Well, if some exception is happening in our flaky method and we're not quite sure what's going on, maybe we haven't minus D'd it, one way that you can get your hands around that is a global variable called dollar $bang. This holds on to the last raised exception that occurred during the current stack. And so if an exception has happened and you're somewhere in your error handling, somewhere in an ensure that's in the course of that getting raised before it's been handled, you can grab hold of what that exception was that occurred and do something with it. Most often, you would want to print it out. So in this case, you would end up with the output that looks something like this. It tells us we had a runtime error, gives us a stack trace of exactly where it happened. Now, the dollar bang doesn't hang around. So after you've gotten all the way out of your stack unwinding and it's been handled somewhere, it vanishes. But if you happen to be in the course of that exception propagating out, this is a really great way to see what's happened and get a handle on the error, even if your error trapping within your code is not set up correctly to do it. All right. Another big problem, I mean, there's lots of problems that come up when you introduce threads into the mix. Um, but errors in threads can be particularly hard to debug. 
if we have this particular bit of code, we've got some sort of main loop driving us, and we spin off another thread, and that thread has an error for some reason, that thread dies. It goes away. It's cleaned up. We don't hear anything from it until later you know, when we expect some work to be done and it hasn't happened. Ruby thankfully allows us to um, make sure that those exceptions do get propagated to us, even though it doesn't do it by default, through the uh, abort, uh, what's happening? There we go. Through the abort on exception on the thread class that you can set. So by saying true to this, this means that any time any thread within your Ruby application raises an exception, that exception will be treated just as an unraised exception on your main thread, and your application will terminate and show you the backtrace of what's happened. Now obviously this would be you know, subpar for you to have in a production system, but if you're debugging something or running something in development, setting a board on exception or in your test uh, infrastructure for instance can be really great for being able to show you as soon as something has gone wrong in one of these multi-threaded contexts. There's nowhere for those errors to hide when this is set. You can also set it on a thread by thread basis if there's reason that you need to do that, but it's a really helpful technique. All right. So that's a lot of stuff that Ruby provides for us right out of the box. But you know, you can hardly get anywhere in writing Ruby code without pulling some sort of gem in, right? And knowing what those gems are doing is really important for being able to understand your application. And thankfully, Bundler provides a uh, nice facility for being able to look at the code that's in the gems that you are using within your app. So if you set your editor variable, there are some other incorrect settings that you can use for that. But um, if you use bundle open after that, then it will open the source of that gem where it's located on disk and let you dig into it just like it's your Ruby project, just like it's code that you've downloaded from GitHub. So in this case, it would look something like this, opens up Vim, and then I can navigate just as though I had downloaded that code. Now this is really great because this is the exact version of the gem that you're running in your application based on your gem file and your gem file lock. This gives you all the information you need to figure out what's going on there. This was such a good idea, in fact, that RubyGems pulled it in with one of the most recent versions. So if you're running at least version 2.4.0, you can do a gem open of your gem name. And this does the exact same thing as the bundle open command. This will give you access to where those gems are located. You don't have to remember um, where they're buried or where one of your, you know, where your rubies are installed and any of those pathing issues. This will take care of it for you. Yes? Yes, you absolutely can edit them. So Ruby code is, it's flat files on the disk and so you can litter your put statements and put whatever you want in there. And actually that's a really good point and leads up to my next thing that, you know, once you have done those edits, well that could be kind of dangerous, right? You litter put statements into the middle of your Rails code, you know. Well, hopefully that doesn't break anything. Um, thankfully, they've thought of that, and there's a gem pristine command. And what this does is it takes the cached version of the gem that was downloaded when you did your gem installation, and it will reinstall that gem from scratch. So you don't have to uninstall and reinstall, maybe get a different version. You can just tell, hey, I was mucking around in there, I know. Let's just clean it up. Jim Pristine gets you right back where you were. So that's a lot of how you can dig into the gems that you've got. Let's take a look now at some different gems that are available that give you other ways to slice and dice your applications. The first one is one that's kind of near and dear to my heart since I wrote it. Uh, it's a, a gem called Hometown. Now, where this comes out of is I've had a lot of issues debugging, particularly um, unstable test um, problems, test ordering issues, where when an object is instantiated has a big impact on how the system's functioning. And sometimes it's hard to tell where objects, especially if you've got singletons or global state running around, it's hard to tell where those are happening. So with Hometown, you can tell it to watch a class, and then that's going to tag any instance of that class that gets created with the information about where it was instantiated so that you can find that later. So in this case, we watch on the thread class. We have a method that goes and spawns a thread and starts it with some sort of work loop going on. And at the very bottom, if we say, what's the hometown for an instance of thread? We grab that thread that we got and ask where it came from. What we'll get back is this nice little hometown trace object. And the important bit is it has a backtrace. It shows you right where that object was instantiated, right where it came from. 
This has saved me several times when I've had tests that are swapping out objects and I don't know which of the tests is actually changing it. All I know is the object isn't what it's supposed to be when I get to a point later on. This points you right to the culprit straight away. So that's a pretty great thing for being able to figure out when an object comes into existence. But you know, a lot of times you don't have quite that constraint of a problem and you want something more general. And for that, I absolutely love Pry. Pry is, uh, was originally written as kind of a replacement for IRB, as a, a REPL, an interactive console. And how you use it, you require Pry, and then on any object in the system, you can say dot .pry. And this breaks into kind of an interactive console, a little bit like a debugger, and puts you in the context of that object so that you can look at it, you can uh, ask it the values of different variables that are around. In this case, we're saying binding.pry. So binding is a method that returns you, as all things in Ruby, an object. And that object just represents our local scope within that method. It shows us the local variables and where we're at in the code. And so this is essentially like we're just adding a breakpoint into our application if you've used other interactive debuggers and other programming languages. When you run this, your console is going to look something like this. It's going to give you some indication of where the code is that it's uh, breaking into, the line and the file, and then show you the specific lines of code and the context right around where you're looking to break. Now, they have a nice sort of mentality that sort of mimics the shell within Pry. And so you can do ls and it will show you everything that's available right in that context. So if there are methods that are right there, instance variables if you're within a class, local variables, all of that stuff gets printed out in a very readable, very um, easy to, to inspect form. You can also move to other objects, similar to ls, as if this is a file system, you can cd to another object, and then that resets the context of where you are. And so all those pry commands that we were doing, like here, we're going to cd into bar like, which is, has the value of true. It's a, it's a Boolean object. And so we can see, hey, it's the true class, and here's some methods, and here's local va values that are on that true object. You can navigate around the objects that you have and figure out what's going on with them very easily with pry. If you lose your way, you know, it's easy to type in a bunch of things, ask about a whole bunch of variables, and lose that context off the stack. You can say, where am I? And it prints out the location that you were at previously. Now, this is pretty sweet, but it does require that you edit your code to put that breakpoint in. And what if you get there and then you realize, oh, that actually isn't where I wanted to be. I wanted to be another two methods further on, or I want to be some other location in my code. Well, thankfully, Pry has a very rich ecosystem of add-ons that have turned it from just being an interactive console to being more of a debugger. There are a number of them that are out there. Um, Pry by, by bug is kind of the main supported one for the latest versions of Ruby. It uses some things that are available there to be very fast and reliable. Pry debugger will work on any of your 1.9s. Or if you're in the sorry state that I am of still supporting 1.8.7, Pry nav gives you a lot of these things and works across just about every Ruby that I've tried it on. So any of these will give you some of the basic primitives of an interactive debugger that you might be expecting to find. So if we go to another little sample, we've got our binding, and then we have step one, two, and three. We can say next, and you see that the little arrow has moved from step one to step two. So next in all of these debuggers is the command to step to the next line of code in the current context that you're in within that method. You can then say step to step into a method. And so here we step into step two, and we see that it's doing some very important work for us. And having figured out what we needed to figure out there, we can say continue, and then the program will pick up and carry on from there. Alternatively to continue, because I love shortcuts, you can also do control D, and that will do the same thing. Let the thing go and let your application run until it hits another uh, pry point in your app. So those steps let you treat um, your application as more of an interactive debugger, which is something that, you know, I. I hesitate to admit I have a background in C-sharp and a little bit of Java, and I've missed those interactive debuggers at some times. And this gives you back some of those things, gives you a little bit more of an ability to step around in your code interactively without having to always res resort to those put statements that I was saying we shouldn't put down earlier. All right. So one other little tidbit to put out there as well, another thing that Pry has, another add-on, is called the Stack Explorer. 
And this gives you the ability to walk up and down the stack, um, not moving the code execution, but looking at the scopes that preceded you in your call. So here we have some code. Parent assigns a local variable whose priority is sleep, then calls to a child. That child's priority is not to sleep. And the child's priority is to play. And then we have our binding where we're going to stop down at the base of this, and we call in. When we break into it, you'll see that there's this frame number that indicates how deep we are in our call stack. We've got our same break where we were seeing earlier. And if we look, we can ask what the priority is. And we'll see that that variable is set to play at this point because we're down in the child. With the pry stack explorer, we can say up. And you'll see that the frame number has changed to indicate that we've changed scopes. We've moved up. But this is not just displaying the code for us that's at that point. It's showing us the state of the world when we were at that point in our execution. And so if we look at priority and we ask what the value of that is, because that value in that local scope was sleep, we get to see that value. So very often, this is really fun and really useful when you don't know why a method got the value that it got. You can step back up, follow the chain of who calculated that, and figure out how those values originated and got passed down in. Last but not least, Price Stack Explorer also has a very nice show stack. So if you do hit this breakpoint and you're like, hey, why did I even end up getting here? Or what path brought me here? Show Stack will give you a very nicely painted uh, stack tree of how you reach that point. Last thing that will call out about Pry has a very nice uh, system for letting you set up aliases and even code uh, to do things. So this is one of my favorite little commands that I've got in it. Um, this will make it so that if you hit return on a single line with no other text, it will find the last command that it did and repeat it. And so if you said next to move to the next line, you no longer have to say next again. You just say enter, 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 enter as long as it takes until you get where you want to go. Um, this has saved me so much typing having this, and I'm very grateful that uh, somebody posted an issue and had the solution out there. So those are some gems and some ways that we can use gems to dig into our code. But those aren't the only sorts of tools that are available to us. Um, let's take a look at some things that dig down either in alternate spaces, other places that Ruby has landed that we may not be as familiar with, or even the layer below, the way the level of your operating system where Ruby itself is implemented. So the first place we're going to look for a little inspiration is JRuby. And those of you who know me or have seen me talk before probably aren't surprised I found a way to shoehorn shoes into, uh, into it. But shoes is a GUI, um, GUI library. It runs on JRuby. And so here, I've started up a little sample application that's running in it. Now, there's a tool that comes with Java, because JRuby is built on the JVM, called Visual VM. And this has a lot of really great options. When you start it up, you'll see over here on the left that it's actually noticed that I have some JRuby applications running. Tells me the PIDs of them. So if I locate the PID for that shoes app that I was running, I can go double click on this. You know, it is Java, very GUI heavy. But there's some cool things that it does under the hood. Once I select an application, there's a lot of different options. I can find summaries about um, the sort of metrics that are happening within my JVM. I can do basic monitoring, look at threads. But one of the things that I like the most about this is that you can take a heap dump. And this shows you all of the objects that are there in your application. Oftentimes, getting your hands around an unfamiliar app revolves largely around figuring out what objects are being created and what's there, especially if you're running into performance issues. So here we can see the various JRuby uh, objects and then the raw Java objects that oftentimes are used to implement those. So this is kind of a cool tool that we don't really have in a lot of other places in Ruby. Um, and actually, the JRuby team, uh, I talked to them a little on Twitter, and they're looking at improving these. These are some things that the Java world has that it's really worth our time to consider and think about um, what you can do with these sorts of tools. The tooling around the JVM is awesome. And there's some cool tricks that I bet we could learn in the Ruby space from that. Rubinius is another alternate Ruby that's around. And the thing that I'd like to call out about it is that it has this sort of debugger, a lot like what we saw with Pry, just built in. This is really awesome. You can just say Rubinius debugger start. And it uh, kicks off a debugging breakpoint. You can see it there. It allows you a lot of the same capabilities we saw with Pry. Um, but one of the bits that I really like is you can set breakpoints. So rather than modifying your code, you can say, hey, break when object.print message is called. 
And in this case, that method isn't even defined yet. And Rubinius recognizes that and says, oh, do you want me to assign that breakpoint if that method ever shows up? And you can say, yeah, sure. And then it will break at that point and carry on fine. So here we see resolve that breakpoint for that point in time. This method was defined after we called that. And you can say C to continue. Similarly to the minus D flag that we have in the main of Ruby, uh, Rubinius also has a minus X debug. And when you run this, what it'll do is it will kick you directly into the debugger right as at the very beginning of your application. And so rather than having to put a breakpoint somewhere, you could stop it at this point in time, assign breakpoints within the interactive console for where you want it to be, and then let the application carry on without even having to edit your code, which is pretty cool. So alternate Rubies have a lot of things to teach us, but there are other layers of our computer for us to learn about. And one of them is the native layer that is often debugged with GDB. That's the GNU debugger. It's used mostly for looking at C and C++ programs, but this actually has some relevance to us as Ruby developers. So what we're going to look at is a basic case of a deadlock in your app. So this is the setup. We've got, we require thread because we want to do some multi-threaded code put out the PID to make sure we can find it. We create a couple of mutexes, because I've heard that if you just lock things in your threaded programs, everything will be fine, right? That's, that's kind of how that works. Um, and then we have a main worker loop here that's going to run. That's actually necessary, because if, if I ran with just the following code that I'm going to show you, um, Ruby detects that there's a deadlock and just stops. So you need something that's actually running to, to keep the thing going. So having pulled that in, we're going to create two threads. The first thread is going to do a lock on M1, sleep for a little bit, and then lock on M2. And those of you who have done threaded code before know where this is headed. We're going to have a second thread. It's going to purposefully lock on the second mutex and then try to lock on the first. We join on these, and the outcome of this is that we never see that puts done message. The reason is that each of these block each other. The first thread grabs M1, sleeps for a little while. While it's sleeping, the second thread grabs M2, and then both of them try to grab each other's locks. This is a classic deadlock. Hopefully, you wouldn't actually write it this way in your code, but this can happen a lot more easily than you would expect. When we run this app, we never see our done message. It just sits here, and in this case, is telling us our PID. So let's break out GDB and see what we can figure out about how this is happening. Once you've got it installed, you'll probably need a sudo to get into it, so sudo gdb. It'll spit out a bunch of stuff about the licensing and then drops you into this gdb prompt. From there, you can attach to the process ID that you gave it, and it's going to spew a whole bunch of stuff at you. But don't worry. Like When you use these sorts of tools, you may not understand everything that it's telling you, but try to pick out the bits of the output that you're going to see that are meaningful to you or that you can recognize. So here, it says something about reading symbols. Like it knows about debugging symbols. And I've actually had problems once or twice where it didn't have the symbols it needed. And this told me why and where it was looking for them. It's also telling us that we've got some threads. This is pertinent to what we're looking at because you know, we know that we're in a deadlock situation. And then lastly, it tells us where we're located and drops us into a prompt. All right, so we're attached to our process. What do we do now? Well, we might want to see what's happening. So we can ask GDB to tell us the backtraces for all of the threads that are running. Now, these are the C-level backtraces. But as we'll see, there's more that you can glean from this than you might think. Here's one of the threads that's showing. But then this is one of the key threads in the problem that we've run into, this deadlock that we've caused to ourselves. And the way that we can tell this is this line, RBX mutex lock, right? It's a deadlock. Something's locking. This is probably the line that's doing it. And interestingly, what we find if we look at a different thread, so we were on thread four, we're now on thread three, we see a very similar line over there, right up towards the top of the stack where, where we're finishing out. Now, the really important bit that you can find from this as well is you see thread.c and it gives you a line number. Well, this is actually pointing you to the Ruby source code. And if you go to that location, you'll see rb mutex lock. This is the C method that implements that, that is telling us that this process was locked. Neatly, most of the things that are public-facing methods in MRI's code have this sort of documentation. And what this tells us is that this is the Ruby method mutex lock. That's how you read that mutex lock there. So this is the mutex. This is how we're locking 
This is that deadlocked code that we have. So if you have a process that's hung, you can get into it. You can potentially look at what's at the top of the stack and maybe get a handle on what's going on with that sort of debugging. You can get information additionally on all the threads that are running and where each of the locations are that they, they're stopped at. You can also switch to different threads to be able to run some of the GDB commands that are um, available at that level on them. But then there are some more fun things you can do. There are some dangerous things. So one of them is that you know it doesn't help a lot. Some of the commands that I want to run when I'm doing this spit into the standard out for the process that I'm running, and that's kind of inconvenient. So I want to be able to redirect my standard out. GDB provides us with a file, an initialization file, where you can uh, set up aliases and uh, define methods that have sets of steps. And so here, what we're actually doing is we're calling the C method for close on file descriptors one and two, standard out and standard error, and then we're reopening them to point at another file ourselves. This lets us trap the output in a way like this. We can give it a file path, and then that output is all going to get logged there, rather than lost in the spew of whatever Rails app we're running or whatever we're trying to dig into. Once we grab that output, we can then call methods. RB backtrace is a method that's directly implemented in, this, in the Ruby VM. This is part of MRI itself. And we can just directly call it, tell it to flush, and then what ends up in that log file is a backtrace of where Ruby is paused, where it thinks it's located at this moment in time. These are the sort of breadcrumbs that you can get out of this to be able to dig in and figure out when you have these sorts of mysteries where things are at, where they're going. Another fun little trick, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't in my experience, but this is actually trying to run a Ruby eval on a string. And so you can pass your GDB script, some piece of Ruby code, and you know, depending on the phases of the moon and exactly how lucky you are, that may or may not terminate and give you the result that you're expecting out of your Ruby code. So GDB is a hugely powerful tool when you need to strip things away and get down a layer below where your Ruby code is executing. But there are some other ways that you can slice and dice at that level too. S-Trace is one of the most powerful ones. S-Trace is a Linux program. It's on uh, Linux-based systems. And what it does is it looks at system calls. So this is the calls that are made to your kernel from the user, uh, user land code. And so when you need to open a file, you need to grab a mutex, you need to um, map some memory, all of these things are system calls on your system. And S-Trace will let you watch those as they go by. The output can be kind of cryptic and a little hard to read at times. But again, let yourself float on the surface of this and look for things that look kind of familiar. Look for stuff that's kind of like what you might be looking for or might, might recognize. So in this case, well, we don't have mutexes, but we see something called futex a whole bunch. This is running against that same deadlocked program. And if we turn around and we go look at the man page for that, we'll actually see that this is a fast user space locking system call. So this is actually what our mutex is implemented in terms of in our underlying system. If you're interested in this sort of approach, uh, James Golick has a really great talk about this, using S-Trace to debug problems in systems and languages that he doesn't even know. And he gets on to uh, you know, a PHP site, and he doesn't really know what's going on, but he uses S-Trace to figure out where the system is getting hung. Now, the one problem with this is that if you're running on a Mac, you're out of luck. S-Trace is only on Linux. There's a system called dtrace that's very similar, but it's also really complicated. And it's a lot harder than strace to get set up. But we can flip that smile, because there's another layer built on top of dtrace called dtruss on Mac systems that does a lot of similar stuff. You know, It's worth spinning up a VM to see this and work with it directly in your Linux uh, environment. But there's also some things you can do if you want to stick on your Mac. All right, running short on time, but there's one last thing that I want to show you. And that's an a, a gem called RB Trace. This came from Amon Gupta. And basically, what this does is this provides you something that's very like the spirit of S Trace, but for your Ruby code. So, if you ever wanted to see all of the methods that are getting executed in your Ruby program as it's happening, RB Trace is the thing for you. You require it, we run this. In this case, I'm just doing a simple loop where I'm printing. If you pass it the minus minus fire hose, that says, show me everything. Every Ruby call that's happening in this application, just go. And you'll see everything that's coming out of it. Now, again, 
as things happen, there's one small downside with that, and the fire hose option is listed in the README as not being reliable on Mac. So your mileage may vary for that. But it provides a lot of other great ways that you can slice and dice things. You can ask for slow methods. If there's a particular method or a class of methods that you want to watch, you can ask for those specific, specifically. Uh, you can have it watch for GC activity. Or there's even tracers, which are kind of collections of methods that are pre-canned for active record and I.O. and all sorts of different spots. So RBTrace is my new favorite tool. I love this thing, and I'm trying to use it anywhere that I can, and I think you should too. So that's an awful lot of stuff, but we've looked at the things that Ruby provides us right on the surface, the easy stuff that you might have done in your first Ruby program. We've gone from there down to gems that you can use to get deeper insight and dig in interactively into your program, and then gone all the way down to the native level. We've looked at tools that let you get into the guts of what Ruby is doing under the hood. I hope that maybe this has given you some tips and tricks, maybe given you uh, some inspiration to dig down to the next layer. Don't be scared of your system. Don't be scared of what's going on. And use some of these tools, even if they're a little frightening at first, to figure out what your app's doing and get a handle on that code. Thank you. I'm a couple minutes over, so I think if uh, anyone has any questions, we can do that after or catch me during the break. Thank you.